All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Throw Away Your Passwords, Trusting Workload Identity. My name is Rick Featherstone. I'm an engineer at Control Plane. Um, for the last couple of years, I've mostly been working with secrets management and machine identity. I work for Control Plane. We're a cloud native security consultancy. We do security audits, consultancy, pen testing, things like that. Hopefully, you've had a chance to come to our stand and talk to people. If you haven't, pop over before you go home. So on the left are the things that I've claimed I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Um, so we're talking about trust uh, in the context of secrets management and access control, but focusing primarily on machine identity, what it is, how do you get one. We're up against the post-lunchtime dip at the end of a long week. Uh, so you're probably all as tired as, as, as I am. Um, I'm going to attempt to cover a lot of ground in sort of 30 minutes or so. So I'm going to focus on concepts rather than going into too much depth on, on some of these things. The idea is to um, give you options that you can kind of take away and apply to the things that you're doing when you get back to your day jobs. Um, just talking about some of the things that are available to you. Some of the things you might already know. Hopefully some of them you don't yet. Otherwise, it's not going to be a very interesting talk for you. So, historically, infrastructure was reasonably static. IP addresses were statically allocated. So you could uh, reasonably use these to represent your identity. Um, firewalls used IP and port combinations. IP addresses were used in X509 certificates. Secrets and certificates were manually deployed to machines by admins. Um, you might have used protocols like Kerberos to initiate trust between machines if you didn't really like yourself very much. Um, but then uh, cloud computing fundamentally changed the way that we do infrastructure. IP addresses are no longer a useful identifier. Workloads come and go. Your workload will get a different IP address as it gets restarted. You could have multiple instances of your workload, so they've got multiple IP addresses at the same time. Secrets distribution becomes a much harder problem with these dynamic workloads. How do you get the secrets on there? Um, with more services wanting to communicate with each other, the old IP and boundary-based approaches, that they no longer work. Secrets management solutions like HashiCorp Vault, Cloud Secrets Managers, Cloud KMS, they help with the secrets distribution. But in order to access the secrets, we need a secret to get access to the secrets management solution. Uh, this is commonly referred to as, as secret zero. And that's synonymous with workload identity this thing that, that workloads can use to prove who they are. So what do we need? We need a trusted third party issuing workloads with their identities. Uh, we need a way for these subjects to retrieve their identities in a secure manner without the need to have a secret in the first place um, and possibly without any knowledge of the identity that they're being issued. We want these identity documents to be short-lived, and we want the acquisition to be uh, seamless um, and, and simple for these workloads. Um, we need a way for the relying party to be able to ver verify uh, the correctness and the, valid the validity of these identity documents. So ideally, the basis for that verifiability is cryptography. And the format of choice for those identity documents will be JWTs, or JOTs, and X509 certificates. So that all sounds great, but how do you get one? How do you get this secret zero, this workload identity? So we'll start simple with something that you're probably um, already familiar with, and then we'll sort of build on that. Um, so who's running workloads on Kubernetes at the moment? Quick show, help me out, a little show of hands. Yeah, loads of you. Excellent. Who's heard of the token review API? Oh, that's surprising. I thought, I thought we'd have more hands for that one. 
So basically, we've got two, two service accounts, the subject and the relying party. They've both got um, service account tokens. And uh, we can use the token review API to verify that token and obtain some information uh, about the subject. Um, it's a simple API call. The, um, the subject's token in, in the uh, payload there, and then the relying parties token uh, in the authorization bearer field there. Um, and we can just make this API call. If you're passing jots around when you're making API calls and things like that, you want to make sure you're using a secure channel to protect yourself against interception and replay attacks. And once you've made that API call, from the response, you can get information back about the, uh, the subject. Uh, the username, the fully qualified name of the service account there. You might use the groups. And now you can use this information to start to make authorization decisions. And this is the most common way of integrating uh, Kubernetes workloads with HashiCorp Vault, a Kubernetes authentication method. So now we can get dynamic secrets, passwords, API keys, certificates from Vault. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, so the, the trust domain here is rooted in your Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes is your identity provider. And if you're building something that's going to run in a single Kubernetes cluster, you can build on this API yourself. Um, it's, it's, not it's not complex, and you can use this to then start to make authorization decisions. If you are passing these service account tokens around, you, you, you need to be careful about, um, about this. So the tokens themselves, they exist for the lifetime of that service account. They're replaced if you delete the token, but they're not rotated. So there's some things we can do to kind of restrict the usefulness of a compromised token. Everybody heard of the bound, quick show of hands, heard of the bound service account tokens? They're sometimes called projected service count tokens. They use the projected volume uh, functionality. They're bound by audience and time. Uh, so in this example here, if our demo service is malicious and we pass it our service count token, it can't use our token to impersonate us to another service because it's bound uh, by that audience there. Um, and this, this works kind of within a single Kubernetes cluster. But if we're, let's say we've got Vault on, on outside a cluster and, and a service account in the cluster talking to Vault, um, Vault needs to verify this token, but it can't use a bound service account token because it's not in that Kubernetes cluster. So now we need to create a long-lived service account token and share that with Vault in order to be able to validate our token. So now we've got a secrets management problem again. Um, we can reduce the risk um, around that token by just giving it permissions to create token reviews. Um, but can we do something so that Vault um, or, or any other relying party doesn't need uh, a token to, to validate our tokens? Well, unsurprisingly, we can. So since version 1.2, uh, 1.12 of Kubernetes and stable since 1.20, uh, service count issue a discovery feature was added. Quick show of hands, if anybody's heard of this before? Uh, quite a few, not, but kind of in my experience, this isn't quite as well known as the token review API. Um, but it's based on the OIDC discovery protocol, which gives you the means to dynamically retrieve the details you need to validate these tokens. Um, and you can have it set up so that you don't need um, any uh, authorization in order to get this information. Um, so you can verify the identity from the token, um, and you can get basic profile information uh, stored in the claims in, in, in your JOT. Um, your relying party should maintain a, a white list of trusted issuers, otherwise anybody um, with an OIDC compatible issuer can, can authenticate. Um, so now you can start to extend your, your, your trust domain. And in order to kind of really understand how this works, we need to understand what's in a JOT.
So it's a, it's, a, it's a simple serialization format. We've got a header, a payload, and a signature. Base64 URL encoded and separated with a period. So we can pipe that through JQ if we want to uh, look, look at the claims uh, in, the, in the payload of a token. You can't decode the signature because it's not UTF-8 encoded, but you're generally interested in the payload. You want to see what claims are when you're messing about with tokens. You might be interested in the header. Um, so there's no, no need for you to copy your service account tokens and paste them into JWTIO just to see what's, what claims are in there. Um, you're welcome. Okay, so here's a decoded token. You can see in the header there, um, we've got the algorithm uh, and the ID for the signing key. Um, we'll come back to that in a sec. And then in the payload, we've got various claims um, for the token there. So we've got some around the validity of the token, the expiry time, not before, um, the issue that time. And then we've got information about the subject um, and also the audience. So, so who is this token valid for? Um, but key to the OIDC discovery is this issuer field. So we'll go back to the previous slide. So with that issuer field, you can append this well-known suffix onto there, and that will give you the discovery document. And from that, we can extract the URL to get the uh, JSON web key set, which allows us to validate the signature. And then we know it's a valid token, and then we can trust the claims that are encoded in that token. Um, it's, it's a fixed URL out of the box with vanilla Kubernetes, but it is customizable. Um, and, so, and, and it's also protected with uh, vanilla Kubernetes. So if you tweak that URL, you need to tweak your, your RBAC so that you can access it. Um, or, you make, or you make that um, uh, unauthenticated. Um, but it's also now supported by your major cloud providers with their managed Kubernetes offerings. Um, it's preview in, in Azure because they kind of went off in a different direction initially, but they've now course corrected and are going down the OIDC route. So what does it look like? And just to kind of reinforce this simple protocol, we'll, we'll go through uh, an example and look at the data structures for, for each of the major cloud providers. So that's, that's the payload for uh, GKE. You can kind of see the issuer. You can tell from that that it's a, a GKE cluster. We append the well-known URL uh, on the end of that. And then we get the discovery document. And we can see some metadata in there. Um, and the key one is that JWKS URI. And if we do a get on that, we get the key set. So we can see there the key ID we talked about a little bit earlier, the algorithm, and then we've got the, the modulus and the exponent for the RSA public key. And then we can reconstitute that public key and verify the signature. EKS looks the same. Take that issuer field. Stick the well-known URL on the end, get the discovery document. Slightly different metadata, but the same kind of thing. The key field, again, is that the JWKS URI, and we get the key set. And for AKS, same sort of thing. Notice the trailing forward slash on the issuer field there. If you're building something yourself, it's, I mean, it's a simple protocol. It's get, extract, get, and you can validate these. Um, and the OIDC spec tells you to check for that trailing slash um, so that you can, uh, so you can get it. So you can, build your, you can build yourself simple codes to get the keys that you need to verify these tokens um, and, and extract the claims. So there's the discovery document and the key set. So in the key sets that we've seen so far, you've only got one key in there, but periodically these will be rotated, and so you will see more keys uh, in that list there. And that's why the key ID is important. You need to make sure that you're getting the right key, um, otherwise your signature is not going to not going to validate, uh, even if your token is valid. So that key ID is uh, is very important. So that's all well and good. What can we do with it? 
Well, you can use it with anything that supports our IDC discovery. It's a, it's a widely used protocol. All the major cloud providers allow you to hook that into their Web Identity Federation. So you can take this token and swap it for temporary cloud credentials. Um, so you can access cloud secret stores, cloud KMS, basically all of the cloud APIs. So now you can start to run your infrastructure's code pipelines on your Kubernetes clusters with temporary cloud credentials. You're not having to put long-lived cloud credentials into uh, secrets in your Kubernetes cluster. You can exchange your token uh, for these temporary credentials. So, and, and you can go cross cloud providers as well. So for example, you could run in GKE um, and you can, you, you can access AWS. So I am roles for service accounts, the, um, uh, from, from AWS that builds on this OIDC discovery um, and this Web Identity Federation. So there's, uh, there's a mutating webhook that AWS provides. You can install this into your uh, GKE cluster and then you annotate your service account with the IAM role that you want to get credentials for. And then when you do a deployment, it will mutate your pod and it will automatically, um, uh, it will automatically uh, mutate it and add the bound service account token for you and also the environment variables required to use the AWS, to authenticate for the AWS APIs. So this is all seamless to your workload, just with, just with that, uh, that webhook in there. Your workload can just use the AWS APIs without having to worry about it. It's pretty cool, right? You can use OPA to enforce access control based on bearer tokens in your API calls. So you can verify the token and make policy decisions based on the subject, the audience, uh, and the issuer. Um, you should probably not just, uh, as I mentioned earlier, not just trust any issuer. You probably want to maintain a list of trusted issuers and check against that. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, so we can get cloud credentials. If we're passing tokens between services, we can do author authorization using OPA. But now we're, now we're in the OIDC space, we can start looking outside of Kubernetes. Um, so your identity provider doesn't have to be Kubernetes. It could be GitHub. So we can run our infrastructure as code pipelines in GitHub and get temporary cloud credentials and, uh, and, and create infrastructure. So in this example, uh, we're, we're configuring uh, GCP to get temporary credentials. So you need to create a service account, a workload identity pool, um, an OIDC provider, and then you do some mapping between the claims in the GitHub token um, and then bind that to the GCP service account that you want to impersonate. And then Google provided GitHub auth action that allows you to exchange that token for credentials. Um, so you can get an access token to use in authorization bearer field for making API calls. You can get a credentials file. Um, and in this case, we're just getting an ID token, um, which is the same as the, the, the Kubernetes jots that we've been looking at, just so that it kind of looks the same. And if we pipe that through JQ, we can see a similar set of claims that we were getting from uh, the Kubernetes cluster. That subject field there, that, that long numeric string, that's the OAuth2 client ID for your GCP service account. And you can look in the console and verify that that's, that's correct. But what, if you need, what if you need more than this? What if you want a meaningful name in that subject field? Um, unlike that numeric value we just looked at or the fully qualified name of your Kubernetes service account. Um, you might have multiple Kubernetes clusters and you want to simplify validation of those tokens between workloads. Um, you might want to use the same workload identity across multiple clusters. Um, your clusters might be repaved regularly and that issuer field might change. You don't want to have to automatically keep changing that, um, that configuration for the OIDC provider. Um, you might want to extend your trust domain over multiple Kubernetes clusters, or you might want to have separate 
just domains for each Kubernetes cluster, but you want to federate them so that you can simplify verifying those tokens across those Kubernetes clusters. You might not even be running in Kubernetes. You might be running on VMs. You might have uh, IoT devices. So we need something a little bit more. We can't just rely on that, that uh, Kubernetes is the identity provider. And that's where Spiffy and Spire come in. So Spiffy defines the standards for an identity framework. The Spiffy ID is the basically the, the format, the representation of that, that identifier. It's a, it's a URI and it's, and it's made up of uh, the Spiffy protocol, the trust domain in this example, acme.com, and then an arbitrary string on the end as your workload identifier, billing.payments here. Um, those SVIDs, the Spiffy Verifiable Identity Documents, they're short-lived and rotated frequently. Uh, the trust domain itself provides you with a bundle, um, which is basically the root keys that allow you to verify um, that SVID. Um, and it could be a JOT, but it could also be an X509 certificate. The workload API, that's, that's how your workloads get, get these identity documents um, and other workloads can get the trust bundles and verify these identity documents. And Spire is the implementation of these spiffy standards. The Spire has um, as a Spire server, then you've got agents that run on nodes and they attest themselves to the server. And then the workloads will attest themselves to the agent running on the node that they're running on. Um, and use the registration API to map uh, selectors, basically metadata, depending on how they, they attest themselves to, to the workload. And you map that to Spiffy IDs. And when you're, when you're creating your Spiffy IDs for your workloads, you map them to the Spiffy ID of the agent. So now you're tying your workload identities to the nodes that they can run on. Um, and then the workloads just use the API to get their, their SVIDs. And they don't, need, um, they don't need any secrets up front. They just, by, by virtue of, of the, the attestation, they can get these identity documents. So we've got a list of the, uh, of the plugins listed in the, in the documentation there. So the node ones, agent to server. The top three there are, are pre-shared secrets. The next two are for Kubernetes. Um, the SAT is a regular service count token. The PSAT is a bound service count token. And then the next three are cloud identity documents. So you can use uh, kind of information that, that this node already has um, or that you've uh, pre-populated and stored on there. And then for workload attestation, three key ones there, Unix, Docker, and Kubernetes. And the, um, the selectors, so for the Unix, for example, the selectors might be user ID, username, group ID, group name, for the process that's running that workload. Uh, it could be the path to the binary on the file system, that the, the digest of that binary itself. For Docker, it'll be things like the image ID, uh, labels, uh, environment variables. For Kubernetes, it's your service account, your namespace, the image, things like that. Kind of just, just metadata about this, th these running workloads. Um, and then when the workloads come up and talk to the node, they're just attesting themselves. The node's checking for this, this metadata, mapping it, uh, knowing which identity to assign. So in this example deployment, we're running on a, on a single Kubernetes cluster. We're using the uh, projected service count token, the bound service count token for the node attestation. Now under the covers, that's the token review API that we saw at the start of the talk. Um, same as the Vault authentication. The, uh, the workloads, because we're running on a Kubernetes cluster, we're just using the, the Kubernetes uh, workload attestation. The OIDC discovery provider, that's an optional component. And that exposes the endpoints to retrieve the discovery document uh, and the JWKS URL. Let's have a look and see what that looks like. Unsurprisingly, the tokens look the same. The discovery document looks very similar. 
and the key set looks very similar. So we talked about X509 SFIDs as well. Um, we focused kind of primarily on JOTs before. And, and the, the reasoning for that was because you can get these from your Kubernetes cluster. You don't need to install anything else. If you're running Kubernetes, you, you've, got, uh, you've got some administration of that Kubernetes cluster. Um, but with, uh, with the service count issuer discovery stuff, you can start to use the tokens that your Kubernetes cluster is assigned to, to authenticate to things outside of your cluster. Um, and that's kind of, it's not free because you've got to manage your Kubernetes cluster, but it's freer than installing a Spire server and, and uh, agents somewhere else. Um, so that's just some of the information in the X509 SVID. You can see in the URI sand field there, we've got the spiffy ID. Um, so trust domain, arbitrary workload identifier. Um, and if we're running, uh, um, that's, that's kind of different to service count names. It's a nice, meaningful uh, identifier. So that, that's kind of useful. We can see that we can use the certificate for server and client authentication. So we can now start to use this for mutual TLS. Um, we can log into Vault with this X509 certificate or anything else that supports um, certificate-based authentication. Spire itself implements uh, Envoy's Secret Discovery Service, SDS. Uh, so Envoy, it's, uh, if you're running Envoy kind of as a lightweight service mesh, that can retrieve these X509 SVIDs and use those for your mutual TLS. And now you're using the same identity for your, um, for, for your certificate, for your TLS, that you'd be using if you were going to pass your, your JOTs around. Um, whereas if you're running um, a, a service mesh like Istio, Istio is issuing different identifiers for your certificates than Kubernetes would be issuing for your JOTs. Um, and again, you can plug Envoy into OPA for, for policy-based uh, authorization decisions. So I did say something about hardware root of trust. Um, so the rest, of, the rest of this deck gives an indication of where, where I think uh, kind of workload identity is heading. Kind of trying to tie that trust down to the, to the hardware level. There's been a couple of interesting talks already this week. Uh, Wednesday, there was a talk about the Confidential Containers project using um, running Kubernetes workloads in trusted execution environments. Um, there was a talk this morning about uh, running Kubernetes in, in trusted execution environments. Um, really kind of interesting stuff, like right down to, to, to hardware level uh, attestation and security. Um, so this is, kind of, this is something I'm just starting to look at. So please don't ask me any difficult questions at the end about this. But I wanted to just uh, give you some information about some of the things you might want to go away and look at and keep an eye on. I'd say it's, it's an evolving field. Um, and so some of this stuff isn't quite production ready, so don't think you can go home and, and, and start to run this stuff, but it's definitely worth um, keeping an eye on. So trusted execution environments, we'll leave that. Guys who, who know what they're talking about much more than I do have already spoken about that this week. Um, actually, I've, I've just scuppered myself there because I'm making up some of this stuff as I go along. Uh, so TPMs. Quick show of hands, who knows what a, what a trusted platform module is? Oh, that's interesting. More people know about that than know about the Kubernetes to Token Review API. That's, see, you can't make assumptions when you come and do things like this. So TPM is a, is a cryptographic device. Um, does things like secure generation and storage of, uh, of keys. And these keys can't leave that TPM in, a, in an unencrypted form. Um, so that's, really, that's a really useful property for, for tying things down to a specific machine. So we, earlier we, we saw that you could use an X509 certificate to attest a node to Spire. But if I get hold of that certificate and walk off with it and put it on another, uh, another machine, I can impersonate that node. With the keys from a TPM, they're, they're encrypted outside of that TPM. and You have to load them into the TPM to decrypt them and use them. So 
I can't, I can't steal your certificate and pretend to be you. I have to be you with, with that TPM. Um, so that's, that's quite a nice property. Uh, PCRs, they're special registers. You, you can read from them, but you, you don't directly write to them. Uh, the, you, can, you basically extend them. So um, the new, it, they, they store a hash of, of something. Um, so the new hash is the old hash plus the new measurement. Um, and Keylime, really interesting to look at. So this uses it with the Linux uh, IMA subsystem. Um, and so it's doing remote attestation. So you can, uh, you can use that to kind of scan the files uh, on, on your node, stick that, uh, the hash of that into the, uh, the PCR and then Keylime can remotely check that. So that gives you the ability to continuously verify the integrity of your remote machines. And on the Keylime site, they've got a nice little demo of removing a compromised etcd node from a cluster. So we can use this with, with, with Spire. Now, I only came across this last week, frantically playing around with it, trying to get it to work so that I could, I could get it in here, but it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so you've got a, a local device ID, which is a, a public and a private key and a certificate that are provisioned out of band, um, and then they come out of the, TP, the, the, the TPM encrypted. Um, and then in the attestation process, the agent loads them into the TPM. The, the server uh, will, will then go through a challenge process um, that can only succeed if, uh, if you've got the keys in the TPM decrypted. Um, so now we can, we can provide harder guarantees that that node is the, the node that we thought it is. Um, the Spiffy ID uses the fingerprint of the certificate, so it's, it's, very, it's very predictable, um, just like the X509 um, and the SSH certificate um, attestation methods. So that's, it's not, I only found it last week because it's not on the main documentation site for the, uh, for the Spire stuff, but it, it looks, looks pretty interesting. And that's it. So key takeaways from my rambling this afternoon. You might already have a workload identity. If you're running on Kubernetes, you have, you've got your service account token. And um, depending on, on what you're trying to do, your Kubernetes cluster might work as your identity provider. If you're running on Kubernetes and just talking to Vault um, it, on the same Kubernetes cluster, then the token review API might be fine. Um, if you're just running Kubernetes workloads and you want to get temporary cloud credentials, then maybe the OIDC stuff works to just swap your token for, for that. If you kind of go into the, the wider fields where you want to use the same JOT and uh, the same identity in your JOT and your X509 certificate, then you might want to think about uh, Spiffy and Spire. You kind of, you've got more complexity um, and an operational and administrative overhead to, to run Spire. But if you need the extra uh, capabilities that that gives you, um, it, it, it's certainly worth thinking about it. Um, so yeah, consider Spiffy and Spire. See if your, if your needs really require that and investigate things like TPMs, key lime and trusted execution environments. And that's me done.